Hi, welcome to Living Water Bible Fellowship. My name is Luke and I'm the worship pastor here at Living Water. We hope and pray that this video encourages you in your walk with Jesus and increases your understanding of the gospel. Through Jesus, we can have new life, freedom, and eternal salvation. Stick around to the end of the video for more info. Good morning to everybody. Glad you are here. Everybody survived the election, which still seems to be rumbling along, right? Huh? Let me tell you something. I haven't been through a lot of elections, but I've been through a few, and I've noticed one thing every time. Somebody wins and somebody loses, right? There's two sides, two different individuals, two different ideologies or beliefs, and somebody wins and somebody loses. But isn't it wonderful to know that our hope is not who's in the White House. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And I, circumstances change. They change all the time. 2020 is a great example of how unbelievably things can change. They change all the time. But our mission and our calling as a church has not changed, and it will not change. We are going to stay on mission. We're going to keep doing God's work because that's what he wants us to do, and that's where our hope is. So praise God for that. We're just going to continue to uh, move right along, okay? As we get ready to, to, to worship this morning, I'd like to read something out of Psalm 91. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful verse, and it talks about how God is truly, he's truly our refuge and our fortress, okay? Listen to this, as we worship the Lord, starting out with word, okay? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the otter, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show my salvation. Let's stand and praise the worship team comes up and get ready to praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this, uh, well, for this day that you've given us. And Lord, we, we do want to pray for our nation this morning. We want to pray for our nation every day. I know there's been a lot of prayers that have gone up during this election. We need to continue to be in prayer. We need to be on our knees praying for your, your hand upon our elected officials. We pray, Lord, that we would be governed by those who believe in you and trust in you and your ways. And may we constantly be in prayer for them, lifting up, praying for your guidance and your watch care upon their efforts. This day we give to you, we pray, O oh Lord, um, that through our worship you'd be exalted and lifted up, and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And you're the all-sufficient sacrifice. So freely given, such a In the name of 
Sometimes when life throws a lot of stuff at you, it's hard to lose sight. We lose our sight of, of Jesus. And so we took this old hymn, and as we sing it, try and recapture what we, what we can lose at times. We get scared. We get frightened. We get worried. But Jesus, the Holy Trinity, they never change. God never changes. So be encouraged as we sing this, this old hymn. Tis so sweet.
If you are a uh, committed Bible study person, if you love the Bible and you are committed to reading the Bible and studying the Bible, you realize that the Bible is a story from Genesis to Revelation. It is one consistent story. Uh, The Bible is not just a place we go to find inspiration for the day. Uh, The Bible is not an inspirational quote generator. The Bible is a story. It is the story of all stories and is the story we live our lives in and through. And when you read the Bible and you recognize this story, you realize that this story has a lot to do with covenants. That you can almost say that God organizes his story around the idea of a covenant. Now, a covenant is a sovereignly administered promise to humanity that God gives. But with those promises, God expects certain things. There are certain obligations along with those promises. We think of the covenant with Abraham the covenant with David, and the covenant with Israel. But another facet to these covenants is that God, when he gives these covenants, he gives a sign and he gives usually a meal for those covenants. He gives a physical representation of his promises. He gives a physical uh, picture of the things that he promises to do. Uh, It is very much like one of our covenant ceremonies in this society, the covenant of marriage. We have promises given, we have obligations to fulfill on both parties, and we have the sign of the ring. Now, if I take this ring off, it's not as if my marriage is annulled, but this ring points to the promises that I've made to my wife. This points to the obligations that I have to my wife, and God does the same thing through these signs of covenants and these meals that God gives for the covenants. Consider the covenants that God makes with uh, humanity and consider these signs. Uh, when God makes a covenant with Adam he tell, and Adam and Eve, he tells them that they are allowed to eat of any tree of the garden to their desire. They are allowed to feast upon any tree in the garden. God makes a covenant with Noah, and the sign of that covenant is the rainbow. When we see that rainbow, God is telling us that he's not going to destroy the world through flood again. That's the sign of the covenant. We think of the covenant with Abraham and the sign of circumcision. We think of the covenant at Mount Sinai and God tells the Israelites to celebrate the Passover, to remind them of the exodus, to remind them of the deliverance. And we also see throughout Israel's history, they uh, participate in many feasts. The Feast of first fruits, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Trumpets, and those types of things. So what's going on here? Why can't God just give us the promise? Why does he give us signs? Why does he give us symbols? Why does he give us meals? Well, these things, they are physical and tangible reminders of the promises of God. They are things that we can hold in our hands. They are things that we can look with our eyes. They are things that we smell with our noses. These are things, are physical reminders of the promises of God. For example, you can tell your wife, you can tell your husband that you love them and that you love them and that you love them. But when you go out of your way to make it a little more special and prove your love with something tangible, it means a little more sometimes. And that's what God is doing with humanity. These things, these signs, these symbols, these meals, they are reminders of his love for his people. They are reminders of the promises he commits to his people. And that's why the psalmist says in Psalm 34, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we as Christians on this side of the cross, we are also in a covenant relationship with God. We are participating in the new covenant And we also have a sign, and we also have a meal. The sign of the new covenant is the sign of baptism. When someone professes their faith in Jesus, they get baptized, and the world looks in on that profession of faith, and they look on in that sign, and they say, yes, that person is professing to follow Jesus. They're a part of the new covenant. And we also have a meal. We have this this, uh, Eucharist meal. We have this Lord's Supper. We have this communion. And these things go together, the sign of baptism and the sign and the meal of uh, the Lord's Supper. And these, as I said, these are tangible reminders of God's grace to us. These are tangible, physical reminders of God's promises to us. As Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. We have that inscribed on the table here. Do this in remembrance of me. And what are we called to remember? What do we have to call to mind to celebrate this meal appropriately? We are called to remember Jesus' life. 
The fact that the Son of God was incarnate and took on human flesh and lived a life of righteousness and perfection. The fact of the matter is the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul, Jesus fulfilled to the T. There was not one moment that Jesus was not in perfect obedience to the Father, in perfect submission to the Father, doing his, his will out of love. He loved the Lord his God with all his mind, with all his heart, with all his strength, and with all his soul, 24-7, 365. Remember his life. We remember his death. The New Testament authors tell us that his death was the atoning sacrifice on our behalf. The book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is no covering for our faults and for our transgressions. We remember his death. But we also remember his resurrection. I've said before, we don't come to the Lord's table and we're not coming to Jesus' funeral. Yes, he was dead, but he is alive. He is seated at the right hand of God. We remember his resurrection. And if we are in Christ, we are to remember that his life becomes our life. That his righteousness is imputed to our account. His obedience is considered to be ours. His death becomes our death. We die to our sin. We die to our corruption. And Jesus leaves those things in the grave, and we remember his resurrection. If he rose, we too shall rise. If he got a glorified body, we too shall have a glorified body. So we come to remember through these tangible, physical things that we hold in our hands, we remember what he's done for us, his body and his blood. We look back and we remember the past. We remember what he's done for us. We remember his promises for the future. This meal is just a small taste of what's to come the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a reminder that God is renewing all things, that God is saving humanity, that God will be the victor at the end of history. These are tangible and physical reminders of the promises of God. So if the deacons would please come forward this morning. Kenneth, would you say a prayer over the elements today? Lord, we thank you for letting us gather here today to worship you. We ask you to help us to slow down and forget all our other worries and problems and just focus on you for a little bit. We're going to thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. On the night that the Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he said that this bread was to remind us of his body. And Peter tells us that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. The wine, as Jesus said, is the blood of the covenant poured out for the forgiveness of the sins of many. This blood covers us from our corruptions, covers us from our sins and transgressions. So brothers and sisters, if you are trusting in Christ today, if you are weak in the faith today, if you need assurance today, Come to the table. Come be reminded from these physical pictures that God loves you, that Jesus died on your behalf, that he has not given up on you, that he is patient with you in all your weaknesses and all your failings. Come, find strength, find assurance at the table today. We have our gluten-free option up here at the front, but uh, please come to the table. Let's start our approaching the table. Come to the table, worship Remember and taste and see that the Lord is good. If you're trusting in Christ today and you remember his sacrifice and you take by faith, let us show our unity to the world by we, as we take in faith as a, unity, as a sign of our unity in Christ. By faith, take and eat. And also let us remember his sacrifice, his blood poured out on our behalf. By faith, take and drink. Our Lord and Father, we thank you for your great plan of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son at the right time to be the sacrifice for our sin. We thank you for his resurrection from the grave that gives us hope beyond this world. Lord, we praise you today. 
We pray, God, that you would give us strength. We pray that you would give us wisdom and skill and endurance for the race set before us. We praise you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us rise, and we will sing the doxology together, and then we will release the kids. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. stay standing and we'll shift gears a little bit in our song. This is a new one for us called Raise a Hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. I raise a hallelujah, fear you lost your hold on me, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, gonna hear your praises roar. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder.
Amen. Sometimes you just have to fight back. Hey, don't you think the coolest thing about our worship team is the drummer? <laughs> Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could remember, from every nation, from all tribes, and peoples, and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God.
come before you, and we know that you are in charge of the entire universe, and that there isn't one thing that escapes you. You know everything, and you are in control of everything. That makes you great. That makes you worthy. Thank you for such peace, for such joy, and that you are so very much worthy of trust. And we put all of our hope and trust in you, period. And we love you with everything that's inside of us. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Struggle and conflict, and there's always challenges presented from the world to the church that the church must address. And this really is indicative of every age that the church exists in. The, the struggle, the conflict is not just particular to the book of Acts, but we see that the struggle has been pervasive all throughout church history. Every age presents its challenges to the church that the church needs to defend, and therefore the church needs to be always involved in defending the faith, or what we call apologetics, a defense of the faith. We see it all throughout church history when conflicts have arisen, apologists have stood up to defend the church and to defend her doctrine and to defend her way of life. And we too, in our society today, have our own challenges unique to us in some sense. In our society, there was a time where being a Christian, especially as a public servant, was seen as a moral and good thing. It was a good thing that you were a Christian in the public realm, in a public politic, politician position, but now we've kind of shifted to where it's kind of neutral space, but now we've even shifted more to where it's increasingly, be, be, uh, it's increasingly viewed as negative to be a Christian, at least in the public sphere. It was a virtuous thing at one point, then we had a time of indifference, and now it's increasingly seen as a vicious thing or a vice to be a Christian in the public sphere. And we know this. We see how persons of faith are portrayed in the media, in the university, and in the entertainment industry. It's no uh, surprise to us that this is how the world is, is beginning to view Christians in our society. And the apologetic method a generation ago or two generations ago was all about trying to prove the truthfulness of Christianity, trying to prove the validity of the faith. We had apologists, men like C.S. Lewis, who tried to defend, you know, the resurrection of Jesus, why it's true and why it's valid. We had apologists defending the fact that there is a creator God and you should believe in him. And there was apologists defending the truthfulness and the authenticity of the scriptures. But today, we, all, we might think of ourselves in a post-truth society. Who cares about truth? Who cares about objective truth? You have your truth. I've got mine. No one believes in objective truth anymore. We have contradictory thoughts in our own mind because we don't have a commitment to objective truth. We live in a post-truth world. So if we do live in a post-truth world and if Christianity is increasingly being viewed as negative, the question before us this morning is, is, is Christianity even good for the world? Is Christianity even good for the world? And I'm not necessarily talking about Americanized or Western Christianity. I'm talking about Christianity and its core doctrines and its core professions of faith. Is it good for the world? That's the question before us this morning. We're going to take a pause in the book of Galatians. So today we're going to talk about apologetics. We're going to talk about this question. We're going to defend the faith from this point of view. Is Christianity good for the world? Peter tells us to always be ready to give a, a defense for the hope that is within us. Jude tells us to always contend for the faith. But before we get into the defense of the faith, the question is why, is, why is this the question that needs to be answered? Why is this the challenge before us today? Well, the reason, or at least one of the reasons, is that there is a conception about what Christianity is in the minds of many Western people today. Uh, there's a story believed about Christianity. There's a narrative that is given uh, that portrays Christianity in a certain light. And stories are powerful. Narrative is powerful. And narrative is essentially just the accepted story about a particular topic. That's what a narrative is. It's not necessarily pertaining to Christianity, but any time we think of narrative, 
It's the accepted story about a particular topic. And sometimes this story is true. But sometimes this story is not so much true. Sometimes narratives, the, the various narratives that we encounter throughout our existence, sometimes it's built around some facts. But sometimes those facts are portrayed in such a way that they actually kind of eclipse the truth or divert attention away from the full truth. And people will generally cling to the narrative instead of searching out the full picture and the full truth. And if someone were to come along and question the narrative or push back on the narrative, they are generally seen as a troublemaker and as a denier. Let me give you a couple of examples of prominent narratives, prominent stories in our society. Let's think of the university for a moment. What's the, the common creation myth in the university? Well, there's no God above us. There's no hell beneath us. Um, and we just evolved from the muck, and we stand here on two legs today with evolved minds and rational minds. That's the creation myth today. Now, let me say that, as I said, sometimes this narrative is built upon some facts. We can look at things like natural selection and say, yeah, that's true. We can look at the reality of, of adaptation and those types of biological mechanisms. But if you were to come and present alternative evidence in the classroom or push back on this narrative, you're seen as a denier. You don't, you don't accept the science. Let's think about another narrative in our society today, the idea of climate change. Climate change. Now, there's, there's no doubt that climates change. There's no doubt that the world seems to be getting warmer. I've talked to people here in the valley to where if there was snow on the ground in October, you would still see that snow in May, and that's just not how it is today. Um, but if you were to kind of push back on that, that predominant narrative we hear in the culture and ask questions like, maybe there's more factors going on in the climate than just human interaction. Or if you were to suggest maybe government intervention isn't the right answer to the problem, you're seen as a climate denier, climate change denier. So narratives are powerful. Narratives and stories have their weight in our lives. So what's the story of Christianity today? What's the narrative accepted in our culture today? Well, obviously, Christianity is oppressive. It's closed-minded. It's intolerant. It's bigoted. It's trying to bring us back into the dark ages. That's the story, except the story in, in our culture today. Christianity is not seen as a good thing. It's seen as a hindrance to the progress before us. If we could just get rid of this religion, we could progress immensely. That's the, generally speaking, that's the, uh, the accepted story, the accepted narrative in our culture today. The irony is, though, and this is what I'm trying to prove today and on my topic today, the irony is, although Christianity is blamed for much of the bad in our society, and although it, it is seen as a hindrance to progress, the fact of the matter is every truly good thing that we love, every truly good thing that we take for granted in our society are products of Christians, the Bible, or the Christian worldview. And that's a bold claim to say that all the things that we take for granted in our society, all the things that we love in our society come from Christians. That's a bold claim. But I want to prove that to you today. And if you're interested in this topic, I've got a couple of book recommendations for you. This first book is called The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization. Now, this book is particularly interesting because this is written not by someone born here in America. It's written by a man born in India. So he's an outsider looking in, and he's looking at some of the successes and some of the triumphs of Western civilization, and he concludes that, yes, it was the Bible that influenced and inspired and is the foundation for much of the things that we love in our society today. And this is not a book that is trying to pitch you some pie-in-the-sky version of Christianity. This is really a work of scholarship. You know, he's got over 600 footnotes. This guy has done his research. It's a very readable book. It's a very fascinating book. So I encourage you, come check it out after the service. And this other one, along the same lines, it's called Why You Think the Way You Do. You ever thought about that? Why do you think the way you do? Why do you have certain assumptions about how the world operates? Why do you have certain assumptions about how we ought to react to certain situations? Well, this author, Dr. Glenn Sunshine, goes through that. He starts in the, Ro in the Roman Empire, and it's really the story of Western worldviews from Rome to home. So if you're interested in those, those books, I encourage you to, to come take a look at those. 
Um, they've been immensely helpful for me. But let me quote um, from the second book from Dr. Glenn Sunshine. This is what he says. He's a historian, PhD, professional historian. He says, all the greatest achievements of Western civilization from the abolition of slavery to the idea of inalienable rights and the dignity and worth of each individual, from the rise of science and technology to the, de to the development of universities, from the emergence of economic theories that have maximized production and raised standards of living to the idea of representative democracies and limited government, all of them were products of ideas that have their roots in the Bible and the Christian worldview. So is Christianity good for the world? Yes, emphatically yes. And I want to prove that to you in a few categories this morning. What I'm going to do is just quote a lot from history, quote a lot from Scripture, draw out some implications, but I'm also going to contrast some differing philosophies and differing worldviews out there. Also, what I'm not trying to do, and I'm not trying to say that Christians have always got it right. I'm not trying to, to portray Christianity in some kind of romantic sense to where we've always been on the right side of the issues. We've always done everything right. Um, I'm not trying to say that, but what, what I am saying is that when we think about the Bible and its impacts and what it has to teach us about the world, much of the good that we have in our society comes back to the Bible and the Christian worldview. So the first thing, why is Christianity good for the world? Well, it offers the world transcendence. It offers the world transcendence. To be transcendent is to be above, and that's what Christianity offers the world. Have you heard this quote before? Let me know if you've heard this quote. God is dead. How many of you have heard that quote before? Do you know who said that quote? Yeah. Friedrich Nietzsche. Good job, Peter. God is dead. Friedrich Nietzsche said that. He was a German philosopher in the 1800s, the late 1800s. And sometimes that quote is kind of ripped out of context to, to say that Nietzsche was just completely antagonistic to Christianity and he's just, you know, um, bashing Christianity. But let me give you, now his critiques, he does, he is a critic of Christianity, but the full uh, kind of context of the quote really gets at what he's trying to say. And let me quote a little more about this, about his uh, quote here. He says, God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all the world has yet known has, has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe away this blood off us? What water is there for us to cleanse ourselves? What festivals of atonement and what sacred games shall we have to do to invent? And what Nietzsche was talking about, he was surveying the religious landscape of his day, and he was saying that these religious people in his day, these persons of faith, faith have killed God. And what he was talking about, they have divorced their belief about God from their everyday life. Although they profess to believe in a creator, and although they profess to believe in a God of transcendence, they don't live like it. Therefore, God is dead. And if the religious people don't live like that, what does it have to do and say for the rest of society? So God is dead. We have killed him. So Nietzsche understood, although he might have rejected core tenets of the Christian faith, if we miss this idea of transcendence, if we miss this idea of God being above us, we miss a core aspect to our faith. God is dead and we have killed him. That's what Nietzsche said. So to say that Christianity offers the world transcendence simply means that there is a creator, a God above us. Now, that's not unique to Christianity. Several religions before Christianity and several after believe in a God above us. But what is unique to Christianity is the idea and the truth that God is transcendent above us, but he is almost also imminent and he moves among us. God is transcendent and he is imminent. God is not a God who just set the world in motion and took a step back. But he's not so immunitized to where we have no higher standard. He's not so down here like us to where he doesn't offer us a transcendent perspective on the world. So God is transcendent, and that's what Christianity offers the world. And this idea of God being the creator is so basic to us as Christians, but it, it really teases out. There's so many implications to God being the creator. Let me quote to you from many passages of Scripture. We'll start in the book of Job. 
God is speaking to Job, and God says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or on what were its bases sunk? And who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you, Job, when I created the earth? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is above us. He is higher than us. Isaiah chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains of the scales in a balance? And the hills in a balance? Who, uh, he, who, he, who, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And all its peoples are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings the princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Romans chapter 1, for what can be known about God is plain to us. Because God has shown it to us, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they, although we, although we knew God, we did not honor him as God or gave thanks to him, but we became futile in our thinking and our foolish hearts were darkened. Now those are just a couple of samplings of God's transcendence above us. He sits above the circle of the earth. His ways are higher than our ways. He is above us and transcendent. What are some of the implications of having a transcendent God? Well, a transcendent God gives us a basis for natural law and natural rights. Because God has created us in his own image and he's given us a conscience, we have a distinction between wrong and right. We know the difference between wrong and right. And because we know the difference between wrong and right and God gave us that difference, we have a transcendent standard. We have a standard above us that we can appeal to and say, yes, this in fact is evil. Not because I say so, but because the God in heaven says so. We can say that, yes, this is truly good, not because I say so, not because it pleases me, but because it pleases God and conforms to his character and law. It gives us a basis for morality. It gives us a basis for justice. What is justice? Justice is morality imposed. That's what justice is. It is morality imposed. You cannot do this. You can do that. It also gives us a basis for natural rights. We think about the idea of rights. As Americans, it's kind of ingrained in us as young children when we study American history. We study the Declaration. We study the Constitution. We have this idea of rights in us. But this idea of rights, things that are given to you, things that you can pursue that pre-exist government, that pre-exist the state, that wasn't how it was for much of human history. Where do these rights come from? Let's, th let's, let's just consider three basic rights in the Declaration of Independence. We all know these things, the, li the, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or property. Where do these things come from? Do you just come at, coming from the mind of Jefferson, just writing these things down? Where do these ideas of the right to life, liberty, and property, where does this come from? Well, it comes from Jefferson, who um, was inspired by John Locke, who grew up as a Puritan. He wasn't a Puritan at the end of his life, but he grew up as a Puritan. And Locke is really referencing here Catholic monks in the Middle Ages, and these Catholic monks are reflecting on Genesis chapters 1 through 3. God gives us life, we therefore have the right to life. God tells us to live righteously, and we have the right to liberty. Adam was called to work and to keep the garden, therefore he had the right to his labor. Life, liberty, and property, these are, these are principles of the Christian worldview. These come from the Christian worldview. Because we have a transcendent God, it speaks to the issues of our day of transgenderism and marriage and abortion. It tells us what is good. It tells us what is true. And it tells us what is beautiful. And we are called to pursue those things. Trans Christianity gives us a transcendent perspective on the world. 
Number two, Christianity gives us science. Now, if I were to walk into the university classroom and I say, hey, all you biological professors, all you chemistry professors, you have Christians to thank for science, I think I would get laughed out of the classroom. But I'm going to argue that Christianity does give us the philosophical basis for scientific inquiry. I want to do this by looking at a couple of different worldviews, some that predate Christianity and some that come after Christianity. Let's think about the, the pagan worldview. And what is paganism? It is essentially uh, people who believe that the gods are so much like them that they're immunitized, that they associate them with nature. We think of Thor and the god of thunder. We think of Poseidon, the god of the seas. And it was hard for the pagan mind to, to, to distinguish between the physical world and the gods. So when you were paying reverence you know, to Neptune or to Poseidon, you were trying to help him, trying to get him to help you get across the seas. So in the pagan mind, you had to be afraid of the physical world, of the natural world. You had to be afraid of it. You had to offer sacrifices in order to get the things that you really wanted. And it produced superstitious behavior. Behind every physical phenomenon is that particular God, the God of that particular realm. Let's think about atheism. It believes that there is no God above us, no hell beneath us, no creator, no intention, no design, no purpose to life, no purpose to creation. At bottom, there's nothing. Cold and blind, pitiless indifference. And therefore, we can use the natural world to our own ends. We can use the natural world to shape and fashion to our own liking. But Christianity comes along and, and it teaches us the dominion mandate, the creation mandate, the cultural mandate. Genesis chapter 1, it says, When God created all things, he created mankind in his image. And it says that mankind was not to dominate the natural world, but to have dominion over it, to be rulers over it in a good sense, to be stewards over the created order to glorify God. That's what Christianity gives us, to be in a, a good and uh, a, a, a good relationship with the natural world, not to be afraid of it and not to use it to our own ends, but to use it for the glory of God. You see, God reveals himself in the pages of Scripture, but God also reveals himself through nature. We believe in general revelation. God reveals himself through the created order. When we go out in nature and we look and we see that creation is beautiful and ordered and powerful, that tells us that the creator is beautiful and ordered and powerful. God reveals himself through nature. And as we come to know more about the natural world, we come to know more about God Almighty himself. Consider these verses, Proverbs chapter 3. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth, and by understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped the dew. Psalm 8 when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. And you made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. Psalm 111. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. The more we come to understand about the cosmos and the natural world, the more we understand about God. But we also, we don't just see the philosophy of science in the scriptures and a justification, a reason for searching out things in nature. We also see how this has teased itself out in history. Many of the, the, the people who gave us the modern scientific method and gave us modern technology and science were, in fact, Christians, or at least they grow up in a society dominated by the Christian worldview, medieval Europe and Reformation Europe. Let me give you some quotes from some notable figures I'm sure you will recognize. Sir Isaac Newton, he said, This most beautiful system of sun and planets and comets could only proceed from the council and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Galileo, the Holy Scripture and nature derive equally from the Godhead. God reveals himself no less excellently in the effects of nature than in the words of sacred Scripture. Johann Kepler, 
God who founded everything in the world according to the norm of quantity has also endowed man with a mind to comprehend these norms. God wanted us to recognize by, that by creating us after his image, we could share his own thoughts after him. And Francis Bacon, man by the fall fell at the same time from his state of innocence and from his dominion over nature. Both of these losses, however, can even in this life be repaired, the former by religion and faith and the latter by the arts and sciences. These are big names, big names in the modern uh, scientific method. And they were Christians, and they appreciated the Christian worldview. Now, of course, this isn't to say that you know, only Christians have done good things for the world in terms of modern science and technology. It's not to say that Christians alone have the corner on technology and science, but it is to say that Christianity really is the only worldview capable of giving the philosophical conditions for scientific inquiry. We serve a God, as Hebrews 1 says, as Colossians 1 says, that created all things and sustains all things. He created all things and sustains all things. Why can the future be like the past? Because Jesus holds it all together. Number three, Christianity has introduced to the world compassion and morality. That's not to say that only Christians are moral, but it is to say we have a conscience for the least of these. We have compassion for those lesser than us. Let me give you a common example in our day, and I want you to give me your natural reaction. Let's say you're driving down the road, and you, you see the lights of red and blue in, your, in, in, in the back part of your car. You know, you're driving down the road, you see the sirens, you see the lights. What is your natural reaction? And for some of you, you think you might be going to jail again. You're not. It's an ambulance. What's your natural reaction if you see an ambulance in the back of your car? What do you do? You get out of the way. Why do you do that? Why are you preconditioned to do that? Why is that your natural reaction? You ever thought about that? Why do we have in this society paid professionals to go potentially risk their lives to save somebody they don't even know? And why should you inconvenience yourself for somebody you don't even know? Why do we do that? That's not how it was in a lot of cultures and a lot of societies before Christianity. Think about the Roman Empire and how brutal it was. The idea that you should inconvenience yourself for someone who's potentially you know, lower than you. Forget about it. The Hindu caste system that breaks society up into these castes. To think that you should go out of your way to help someone lesser than you. Forget about it. So why do we do this in our society? It's because Christianity has given us this soft conscience. Christianity has given this this soft conscience and has really made the world a better place. And I wanted to encourage you to do something this afternoon, to go on the internet and look up Global Corruption Index. Go online and look up Global Corruption Index. And that's an organization, it's not a political organization, it's kind of like a think tank and they collect data. And essentially what they do in their data collection, they, they rank each country in the world based on their level of corruption. Based on how corrupt that country is, they put that in a rank and they put that out every couple of years. You know, so those nations who are not so corrupt, they make the top of the list. Those nations who are very corrupt, they make the bottom of the list. And what's fascinating about this index is that most of the, most of the top countries which would be most of the least corrupt countries in the world, have been those countries where the Bible has permeated the culture, where the church has had a witness for a very long time, where the Christian worldview has had its effects in that culture. Those, those societies which are the least corrupt are those societies where Christianity has had a witness for a very long time. It's not, not every single country is like that. And I'm not saying that these countries nowadays still believe in Christ and appreciate the Bible. But what, we, what I think we can say is that these countries, these societies are still reaping the benefits of the Bible and the Christian worldview. And why is that? Because Christianity gave the world things like institutions for the common good. Hospitals, schools, universities. These are products of the Christian worldview. 
We see that the New Testament encourages us to good works. Jesus encourages us to love our neighbor as ourself. A couple of sermons ago, I talked about the the man John Wesley and how he essentially almost single-handedly changed the moral landscape of the United Kingdom, the British Empire, in the 1700s. By his preaching of the gospel and by the things that he did, by setting up hospitals, distributing literature, encouraging education, you know, helping out the orphans and the widows, by doing these things, he almost single-handedly changed the, the moral face, the moral fabric of the British Empire. Historians believe the very first hospital was established by a man man named St. Basil in the area of Asia Minor in 369 A.D. His house of healing, his hospital, had 300 beds. And a man by the name of Thomas Sydenham, he's known as the father of English medicine, was a Christian. The father of English medicine was a Christian. And he wrote texts and he wrote lectures to encourage the practice of medicine. And this is, what he, he, this is some of the advice he gives his potential doctors. This is some of the advice he gives the people who want to practice medicine. He says, first of all, realize you're going to stand before the supreme judge and give an account for every patient that you see. Second of all, give glory to God for everything you do. Thirdly, remember to treat each person with worth and dignity. And he says, because the reason for this is because Jesus Christ took the form of the human being. He became a man and therefore raised up the dignity and worth of every single human being. The fact that God would identify himself with us in the flesh speaks volumes to how we ought to treat one another. We know that all the great preachers, many of the great preachers in our tradition, Spurgeon and Whitfield, established orphanages everywhere they went. Women like Amy Carmichael and Mary Slessor went abroad to do the good work of the Lord. Men, women, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox alike have been committed to good works, have been committed to establishing institutions for the betterment of the world. And why is that? The answer is our Lord himself. It was Jesus who preached the good news to the poor. It was Jesus who ministered to the outcasts of society. It was Jesus who had compassion on the crowds, and he deemed them as sheep without a shepherd, lost, afraid, And vulnerable. It was Jesus who told his disciples to lay down their lives for others. It was Jesus who told his disciples to let the little children come to him. And it was Jesus who ministered to the lepers and the tax collectors and the Samaritans. That was the pattern in Jesus' life. That was the pattern in the apostles' life. But it was also the pattern in the early church's life. When the plague used to come through Rome and wipe out much of the population, the aristocracy, the rich people, the people who had a name would flee the city. They would get out of town to save themselves from the plague, but it was the Christians who would go into those hot spots and go into those areas of the plague to minister, to preach the gospel, and to do good works for those who are sick. We see it was the Christians who were adopting the babies who were thrown out of Roman society in the sewers. During the time of the Reformation, it was those Protestant preachers going into the city to preach to those who were dying and to minister to them. Why do we have a soft conscience for the least of these? Why should we care about those less fortunate than us? Why should we inconvenience ourselves to help those who need help? It's because Christianity introduced that to us in its doctrine. Fourthly, Christianity offers the world a great story, perhaps, and even the best story. What is the story of the Bible? If you could sum up the Bible's story in one phrase, in one sentence, what would it be? Have you ever thought about that? If you could sum up the story of the Bible in one phrase or in one sentence, how would you summarize that? If someone asked you that question at Thanksgiving coming up in a couple weeks, how would you answer that question? Well, here's a potential way to sum up the Bible. What is the story of the Bible? Kill the dragon, get the girl. That's what the Bible is. Kill the dragon, get the girl. You see, the central figure in the pages of the Scripture is Jesus Christ himself. And yes, Jesus is patient and humble and loving, and he accepts us in our weakness 
But the main portrayal of Christ in the scriptures is one of a warrior king. Who is Jesus? He's the warrior king. In fact, the very first prophecy of Christ, the very first mention of this promised one is one who goes to do battle. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman is going to crush the seed of the serpent. The very first prophecy of Christ is of him as a conquering warrior king. And that serpent who slid his way into the garden, Jesus will crush with his heel. And he will kill this dragon, this this dragon who commits chaos all over the world. It is Jesus who will come to rescue his bride, the church, and remove the curse as far as it's found. Every story that we love, movie or book, follows the Bible's story in some form or fashion. In some form or fashion, this idea of blessedness, this idea of despair, this idea of heroism, it's found in Christ as he is the great warrior king. And lastly, what does Christianity offer the world? Why is Christianity good for the world? It offers the world optimism, hope, and joy. Regardless of external circumstances, regardless of whatever is going on in the world, there are certain things in the Christian worldview that are undeniably and always true. The fact that God is on his throne, that God is sovereign over all things, directing the affairs of men, the reality that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, that he has defeated death, that he has saved us and chosen us, adopted us and made us secure. The fact that God has given us his word to guide us and to encourage us. He's given us the church as a family. And the reality that Jesus is making all things new. This very moment, regardless of what is happening in the world, these things are true. These things are true. And what is the end of the story? Why should Christians have hope in dark days? Why should the joy of the Lord be our strength? Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the, earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is the end of the story for us. This is the end of the line for us. We are destined for hope and optimism and joy. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as the crystal, flowing from the, throne of the, from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the city, also on either side of the, ri- the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and that his name will be on their foreheads, and the night will be no more. And they will need no lamp of light, nor sun, for the Lord their God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's a message the world needs to hear. That's a message that we need to hear sometimes. Christianity gives us hope, regardless of the circumstances in our lives. Regardless of the chaos in the world, Christianity gives us hope. So is Christianity good for the world? Yes and amen. Brothers and sisters, you are good for the world. You are good for the world. God has blessed you with certain gifts, certain interests, and certain resources. God has blessed you with certain abilities and skills. And it's our calling to put those to work for the glory of God and the good of humanity. Brothers and sisters, we are the the good of the world. We are good for the world. In your professions, in your roles, in your responsibilities, you are good for the world. 
So brothers and sisters, let us continue this great tradition that we've been handed. We are standing on the shoulders of giants in the Christian tradition. Let us continue it. Let us do good for the world. Let us pursue godliness. Let us pursue holiness. Let us pursue creativity for the goodness of humanity and the glory of God. So if you'd please stand this morning. From the book of Jude. And to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, and majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So may you go now into the world with strength and courage, pursuing God and the good of humanity. May God bless you. Thanks for tuning into this teaching from Living Water Bible Fellowship. We hope that you are encouraged and challenged by this video today. Living Water exists to lead people into a life-changing and an ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're interested in learning more about us as a church, links and only contact info are in the description below. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and to hit the notification bell. Thanks for watching.